so much to Today, I want to start out and just tell you a little bit of a story about a family. Uh, there was mom, and there was dad, and there were six children. And all of these children grew up eventually. And two of the children, one of the children was, one of the sons was named Adam, the other was named Luke. Uh, these two looked at what their parents had done for them. They, they realized the sacrifice that their parents had made. And they truly did love their parents. The other four, however, uh, they disconnected from the family. Uh, at, at best, they were unconcerned. Uh, they were resentful of some of the things that they felt their parents had done. In essence, they, they pretty much hated their parents. And the fact is that even with all of this, the parents continued to love their children. Even with all of the things that they were out in the world doing that they didn't approve of, even the, the fact that they treated them badly and treated them with disrespect, these parents continued to love their children. But then you had these other, you had these other two children. You had, you had Luke and you had Adam, and, and they truly did love their parents, and they took issue with the way that their four siblings were treating their parents. And so they each responded to it differently. Now Adam, Adam was a little bit of a hothead. And so what he did is he met that hatred with anger. He let his siblings know exactly how angry he was with them. He let them know how ungrateful he felt they were. He let them know how much their parents had actually done for them and how they should feel ashamed in treating their parents the way that they were. He talked about all of the things that they had gone out in the world and done that they knew that their parents would disapprove of. And then there was Luke. And Luke was angry as well. He didn't like the way his parents were being treated by his siblings. He didn't appreciate that at all. But what he did, he didn't meet that hatred with the anger that Adam met it with. He reminded his siblings that no matter what they did, no matter how far away they went, that their parents still loved them. And he told them that because Mom and dad love you, I'm going to continue to love you as well, even though you don't make it easy. He didn't spend a lot of time talking about the things that they were doing that made mom and dad, made mom and dad angry. He made mom and dad feel sorrow. He did discuss those, but he didn't spend a lot of time on it, and he didn't talk about it with anger. The key thing that Luke wanted his siblings to understand is even though they had disconnected themselves from the family, even though they were doing things that were displeasing to the parents, that the parents still had love in their heart for their children. And that at any time, if they decided to return home, the door would be open. That's how Luke decided to meet and confront hatred. And that's what we're going to talk about today, hatred. As Christians, as members of the body of Christ, how are we supposed to confront hatred? Well, the answer is we confront hatred like Jesus confronted hatred. And so we're going to look at how Jesus talks about what is going to happen and, and, and how we can expect to be treated as followers of his. By looking at the gospel according to John chapter 15, starting at verse 18, and we will go into chapter 16, verse 3. So the gospel according to John chapter 15, 18 to 16, 3. I'd ask that all who could would please stand in reverence to God's holy word. Once again, confronting hatred like Jesus. These are the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, from the New International Version. If the world hates you, keep in mind, it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. 
That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than the master. If, the, if, they, are persecu if they persecute me, they will persecute you also. If they obey my teachings, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now, that I, now they have no excuse for their sin. Whosoever hates me hates the Father as well. If I had done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and the Father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. When the advocate comes, whom I will send from the Father, the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogues. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his most holy and most true word. You may be seated. So, the conversation with the disciples is getting a little bit somber now. Started out, he washed their feet. He talked to them about humility. Talked to them about mercy. Talked to them about love. He has talked to them about the fact that they must bear fruit and be willing to stay connected to him. He talked to them about truth. But now he goes into a different direction and he says, don't expect for things to get easier when I'm gone. It says, now if the world hates you, understand that they hated me first. And the reason why they hate you is because of me. Now, if you had stayed in the world, they would have loved you because they know you and they understand you. But you're not in the world anymore. I've chosen you. I've taken you out. I've chosen you to be my disciples, to bear fruit, to go and to testify to me. And because of that, the world is going to hate you. And understand that Jesus is not mincing language here. He is using a very strong word, the word hate, and he's using it for a reason. He wants them to understand that this is beyond annoyance. This is beyond dislike. This is, in fact, hatred. And it's going to happen to them because it happened to him. He explains to them, you're going to be put out of the synagogues. You're going to be kicked out for preaching the doctrine of truth that you preach. You're going to be chased. You're going, and the time will come when people will kill you and think that they are doing a service to God. And of course, if we follow church history and tradition, we realize that these words did ring true for church history and tradition teaches us that of all the disciples, only one was not martyred. Only one did not die in the profession of their faith. We know even in the biblical writing, it is, it, we know what happened to James. He was killed by Herod. Uh, church tradition tells us that Peter was crucified in Rome. And all of the other disciples, save one, John, the, God, the one who wrote the gospel that we are studying now, was not martyred. And understand that the only reason John was not martyred is because it just didn't happen. It wasn't because they didn't try. They threw the man off of a cliff, and he lived. And, and so even then, they were trying to kill him for his faith. Jesus wanted the disciples to understand the depth of hatred that, would, that they would encounter because of what they believed. Now understand something about hatred. Hatred does not always come in this form. It isn't always so overt. Sometimes it can be subtle. Sometimes it can be difficult to see, but yet it is still there. 
And why is that important to understand? Because Jesus was telling the disciples, they will hate you because they hate me. He also wanted the disciples to tell the people that they taught, they are going to hate you because of who you serve, because of Jesus. And what we need to understand today is that the world, those who are outside of the body of Christ, the world hates the body of Christ. If you are a Christian, if you are a member of the body of Christ, the world hates you. Not dislikes, not is annoyed by, the world hates you. And the question is, well, how do we meet that hate? Well, first of all, let's look at why this happens. First of all, understand that the world loves those who are within the world. You have the same values, you have the same world view. They can understand where you are coming from. And part of the reason for the hate is that for some reason it is within human nature to hate that which we do not understand. If you look all throughout history and you look at some of the conflicts and some of the difficulties in human history, a lot of it comes from not understanding that person or that group of people we consider an adversary. And so the world, because they do not have the Holy Spirit, the world, because they do not believe in God, they cannot understand the people of God, and so there is hate. For those that remain in the world, that have a secular worldview, that have a worldview that is absent of the gospel, the world loves them. And Jesus said as much. If you're in the world, the world loves you. But we're not in the world. The world hates us, and it hates us because of Jesus. It hates us because it cannot understand us. It cannot understand how you can stand up and say, I believe that all of this universe, that this great universe, this great planet, this earth was created by someone. They don't understand how you can stand there and say, well, no, I don't believe that out of nothing came something, that one day there was nothing and all of a sudden there was this great explosion and the universe came into existence. I don't believe that. I believe that someone created the universe and that someone is God. They don't understand that. They don't understand how when uh, the deacons and I were, were talking this morning and, and, and Ron was talking about flying over the area that had been burned and just three weeks earlier it was all charred and black and now you see that greenness and that life and that vibrance. They don't understand how we can look at that and say, look at what God does. They look at it and say, well, it got burned and then there were some mineral things that happened and, and of course, okay, it's green now. But they, they can't understand how we can see things the way that we do. And because they don't understand, they hate what they cannot understand. And what we must, what me must be willing to do, what we as Christians, as members of the body of Christ must understand, we must not only know that persecution is coming, we should expect it. We should expect to be attacked. We should expect to be persecuted. Right now, if you were a Coptic Christian in Egypt, you would be worried that one day you would go to your church and it'd be burned down. If you were a Christian in the uh, ISIS-held territories of Iraq and Syria, you would just be worried about living to the next day. You would be worried about keeping your head connected to your shoulders. If you were a Christian and you actually had the audacity to be in an unregistered church in China, you would worry about being arrested and maybe beaten. In the time of the Soviet Union, if you were one who professed a belief in Christ, you were worried about disappearing and, and maybe not being seen again or not being seen for several years. No trial, just that you dared to profess Jesus Christ. Now, of course, in the Western world, we don't deal with that type of persecution, but it is still there. Look at our neighbors to the north in Canada. They're, right now in Canada, in pulpits, there are pastors who are preaching the word of God. But if you are a pastor who wants to preach this entire Bible from Genesis to Revelations, there are certain passages that if you preach in this Bible, you could be accused of and brought up on charges of hate speech. That's just our neighbors to the north. Now, we haven't gotten to that point in this country. 
yet. But there is still a price to be paid for being one who follows Jesus. Perhaps if you're in an environment where that isn't what they believe, then you miss out on a promotion. There, I was watching a news story on CNN the other day, and they were talking about how there are actors in Hollywood who are openly, who openly profess a belief in Jesus Christ who aren't able to get certain roles because of that. That's a price that they have to pay for being willing to profess that they believe in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Maybe you will lose friends. Maybe you will lose acquaintances. Maybe the circle that you run in won't want you to run in that circle anymore because although they won't use the word, they are a part of the world and the world hates Jesus. And because the world hates Jesus, they hate those who believe in Jesus. Now they'd say, no, it's not hate. We just think you're confused. We just think you're backward. We just think you're too traditional. Those are the words they will use, but it all comes down to one thing. As the word says, they hated Jesus and they will hate those who follow Jesus. Some people, some people will even go as far as to hate you and in some cases do harm to you and think that they're doing the will of God. And that comes in all different shapes and sizes. Again, in a world where you have ISIS and Boko Haram and Al Qaeda, all sort, all individuals that will kill people and say that they are doing the will of God. But even within Christian circles, we see it happen. A few years ago, there was an abortion doctor by the name of Tiller. And a professed Christian walked into his church on Sunday morning and shot him dead and said that he was doing the will of God. Just a few weeks ago, there was a, a gentleman who walked into a Pran Pranhood clinic and began shooting and killing people and saying he was doing the will of God. Now, I'll tell you what, I did not agree with what Dr. Tiller de did. I thought that it was 100% wrong. I do not agree with some of the things that Planned Parenthood does. But I also do not agree with people who go into places like this and enact violence and say that they are doing it and they are doing God's will. No, you are not. As a matter of fact, you hate God. Those people, there are people within the body of Christ, that at least they say they're within the body of Christ, but they too hate God, just like these individuals that Jesus was talking about. He told his disciples, remember his disciples are Jews and they are believing Jews. We have to remember our faith, it comes out of Judaism. Jesus was a Jew and these believing Jews, these, these disciples were going to be kicked out of their synagogues, their churches, because they were preaching a doctrine that the church did not follow. They were going to be people like Paul, who, Paul, who went and said, give me a letter so that I can go to Syria so that I can arrest and kill some Christians and I'll be doing God's work. But he didn't know God. Now he ran into him on a Damascus road and it changed his life. But before that, he didn't know God. And there are people in our churches today, there are people within our circles that claim to know God, but they do not. And just like Paul, before his conversion, they too hate God because they don't understand. So the question is, how do we meet this hatred? How do we confront it? Because the thing is that we have to confront it. It's not something that we could just stand back and hope it goes away. This is a sinful world. Sin is never going to go away. And because sin isn't going to go away, the hatred isn't going to go away, we have to confront it. So what do we do? We have to confront it like Jesus confronted it. How did Jesus confront hatred? He, can, he used two things. He confronted it with truth, and he confronted it with love. Let's talk about truth first. Jesus was truth. He was the Word made flesh. And when truth and hatred meet, hatred cannot stand up to truth. Again, the biggest example to me is if I have a believing Christian over here 
and I have an atheist over here, and I, I ask that Christian, how did the universe come into being? And they say, well, Jesus, God brought it into being, and, and he created it, and he created the stars and the moon and the heavens. He created all of that. And you say, okay. And then you go over here, and, and you, you speak to this atheist and say, well, how did the universe come into being? And they say, well, at some point there was nothing, and out of that nothing came something. Hmm, that's a lot of faith. When you speak truth, hatred cannot stand up to truth. As much as, much as our explanation of the creation of the universe does not make sense to a non-believer, when we listen to it, we're like, Okay, but this does. Something from nothing does make sense. So we confront hatred with truth. We confront hatred with the truth of the Holy Spirit that is within us. We confront hatred with the truth of God's word. That is how we confront hatred, but we also confront hatred with love. Notice that Jesus did not attack those who hated him. He went to the cross for them. He did not meet those who hated him with hate. He died for them. And just as he did, we are also to do. Let's look at what he had to say to us about love and meeting hatred with love by looking at the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. This is what it says. You have heard it, you have heard it said that you have heard it that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of the Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward have you? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even pagans do that? Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect, love your enemies. Love those who hate you. And so, Jesus is telling us, you do not meet hate with hate. You do not meet anger with anger. You meet hate with love. You meet it with kindness. You meet it with mercy. You meet it with forgiveness. And, un uh, and understand, I know that what I am saying here is hard. I do not profess that it will be easy to love someone who hates you. I do not profess that it will be easy to be kind to someone that is not kind to you. I do not think that it's going to be easy to care for someone who does not care for you. Yes, it's going to be difficult, but it is what God has called for us to do. And when you think that it's difficult, when you get to the point where you think it's just too hard. I want you to remember that Jesus did the same. He met hate with love. I'm pretty sure that it was not easy after being beaten and having a crown of thorns placed on his head for him to lay down on that cross, allow for nails to be placed in his wrist and his feet, be put up on that cross and hear, hear the people mocking him, hear them saying, well, if you're the son of God, save yourself. I guarantee you it was not easy for Jesus as he's hanging there on the cross to be being basically told off by a man hanging next to him saying, aren't you the Messiah? Then save yourself and us too. It was not easy for him to hang there and hear all of this and utter the words, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He met the hatred with love. No, it was not easy, but he did it. It was not easy for him to know all that we as humanity would do against him, that the majority of humanity would continue to hate him, but he went to the cross anyway. And if he did that for us, is it too much for him to ask that we meet hate with love? Amen? And it's going to be hard, but it's not impossible through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Back when I was in high school, I first, I experienced the first real tragedy of, of life. And it wasn't really a personal tragedy, but just to see tragedy firsthand. When I was in my sophomore year of high school, it would have been 1989, and there was a gentleman in my class, I didn't know him well, but I knew of him, whom this particular morning they, went on, they got over the school PA system and, and uh, announced that he had been found shot dead in an alley in Detroit. <clears throat> a few weeks later, they caught the individual who did the shooting and he went through trial and, and, and this, the, the gentleman that he's killed, his mother was there and she testified. And a few years ago, I went to my 20 year class reunion and at our dinner, she looked familiar so I asked who she was and she reminded me that she was this young boy who had been killed in my sophomore year, she was his mother. And she recounted to me how things had gone after her son had been killed. She said it took about three years for her to get to this point. But after three years, she decided to go and visit the man who had killed her son. And she said he came in and he had just this angry look on his face and, he, and his mouth was all poked out and he's sitting down and he's looking at her, well, what do you want? And he didn't even really recognize her and she explained who she was and his response was, so? And she said, well, it took me a long time to get to this point, but I want you to know something. I don't hate you. And I forgive you for what you did to my son. And because I know God loves you, and I'm a child of God, I love you too. I don't, I don't appreciate what you did, but I want you to know that you have the love of God and you have the love of one of his children. And she just left. So it was about two months and she got a letter from him. And again, you could tell that this letter was written, it was an angry letter. That, and, and he just asked if she would come and visit. And she went and she visited him and he said, he, you know what, I don't understand. He's, here's that word, don't understand. See, if they are outside of the body of Christ, they cannot understand. They, they can't fathom how we are the way we are. He says, I don't understand. I killed your son and never once have I shown any remorse for it. And the reason I haven't shown any remorse is because I don't have any remorse. And, he, and I, I, I showed you nothing but anger and you came in here and told me that you forgive me and that you love me and God loves me. I don't understand how you can do that. And she said, well, you know, until you get Jesus, you won't understand. She said, but I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come visit you once a month. And we can just sit down. We don't have to talk about my son. We can just sit down because I know you don't have any visitors. I know that your family has turned their back on you. So I'll come visit you once a month. And she did that. She visited him once a month. And his heart started to soften. After two years, now if you want to talk about patience, after two years, he started to understand because the word was starting to get inside of him. She had built this relationship with him. She was not meeting his hate and his difficulty with hate and difficulty. She was meeting it with love. And eventually, that young man gave his life to Christ. More importantly, in 2009, he came up for parole. And one of the parole officers came and talked to this woman and said the only reason they had pretty much now, this is technically illegal, but they had pretty much made up their mind before he came in the room that he would not be getting parole. They, they looked at his, his chart, they looked at his rap sheet, said, there's no way we're letting this guy out. They told that woman that the only reason that he got parole was because she testified on his behalf. I think that was easy. This man killed her son, but she did it. Now, what are the benefits of this? While that young man was in, in, in prison, he got his degree in social work. When he got out of prison, he got his master's degree in social work. 
Now he continues to live in Detroit. He is a counselor at a boys' home. And his mission is to get boys that are on the same track that he was on and to try and to turn them in a different direction. To date, he has said that he knows of at least 15 boys that not only has he gotten to go in a different direction than him, but that has given their life to Christ. Now, see how this works. This young man has led 15 young men to Christ. That doesn't happen if this woman whom he killed her son does not meet that hatred with love, go and visit this man who killed her son once a month for two years before she starts to get a response and leads him to Christ. Because she led him to Christ, he has led at least 15 other people to Christ. You want to see the cost of being able to meet that hatred with love? It is our ability to build the kingdom. And we should get excited about that. No, it won't be easy. And I am standing up here as your pastor, I'm standing up here as I preach the word telling you, the reason I know it won't be easy is because there have been times that I have failed at it. There have been times when I should have met that hatred with love and I didn't. God forgive me for that. So I know it's not going to be easy, but it is what God has called us to do. And we're going to have to continuously work at it. And we're going to have to continuously pray about it. And we're going to have to continuously ask, Holy Spirit, help me. Because it is going to be difficult. But that is how we are called to meet and confront hatred. We confront hatred with the truth, the truth of God's word, the truth of the Holy Spirit in us. We confront hatred with love, the love of God, the mercy, the kindness of God. We show others what has been shown to us. So let's go back to our story. Where are you? Let's look at our family. Where are you? Now, of course, mom and dad would represent God. So none of us are there. Are you the four siblings? Because the four siblings represent the world. Those are the people who hate God. And you say, well, you know what? I haven't made a decision for Christ yet, but I don't hate him. Well, understand there are only two options. Love God, be a part of God's family, or not. And if you are not a part of God's family, you are a part of the world. If you are part of the world, you hate God. You may not use that language, but that is where you are. And I know that might make you feel uncomfortable, but part of what God does with us is he makes us feel uncomfortable. Because when we're uncomfortable, we start to search. We start to ask questions. We start to look. And the fact of the matter is, if you are not within the family of God, you are in the world, and the world hates God. Not my words, the words of God. Are you Adam? And unfortunately, too many Christians fall into this Adam predicament. You see, because Adam loved his parents, and he hated what his siblings were doing to his parents, and so he was constantly on the attack. He was constantly telling them about their sin. He was constantly telling them about their ungratefulness. He was constantly telling them about how wrong they were, and he was meeting that hatred with anger. And all too often, we as Christians meet the hatred of the world with anger. We cannot do that. You cannot turn the world around by meeting hatred with anger. If that woman had met the hatred of the man who killed her son with anger, he would still be in prison today. Well, maybe somebody else would have come along, but you get the point. We can't meet that hatred with anger, but all too often, we do that. Here's an experiment. Find someone that you know is either a marginal believer or a non-believer and ask them, when you think about Christians, what comes to mind? And you'll be surprised. Because the first words out of a lot of people's mouth is not going to be love. 
It's not going to be grace. It's not going to be mercy. It's going to be what we are against. We are known in many circles for what we are against. And should we be against those things? Yes. I'm not saying that we change our theology. I'm not ch saying that we change our belief. What I'm saying we change is our methods. We can't be Adams. We need to be Luke's. Because notice what I said about Luke in the beginning of the story. He wasn't happy either. He was angry about what his siblings were doing to his parents, but he reminded them of the grace and the mercy and the kindness and the love of their parents. He also reminded them of what it would be like to never be able to be in the presence of their parents again. And the reason that's important is because that, my brothers and sisters, is hell. Hell is never ever being able to be in the presence of our God and Creator again. It is darkness. It is fire. It is total absence of God. Now for some people they may think that's what they want and so be it. Understand some, some nuts you will never crack and that's okay. But we have to confront hatred. We don't have a choice. We have to confront it but we confront it the way that Jesus teaches us to confront it. And if you have difficulty with that, and I know some of you do, then pray. Get yourself a prayer partner. Ask for the strength of the Holy Spirit, because that's the only way you're going to be able to do it. Because it's a lot easier to meet hate with hate. It's a lot easier to meet anger with anger. It's a lot easier to meet indifference with indifference, and we can't do that. We have to meet it with truth and with love. That is how we confront hate. So where are you? Are you the four siblings? Are you Adam? Or are you Luke? Wherever you are, strive to be Luke. Amen? Let's and so